Well, let's open up our Bibles this morning to uh, the book of Acts in chapter 11. I'm going to start there. I'm going to ask the question, first of all, and uh, uh, I have a few times now been answering questions and talking about uh, some of the things uh, going on in the world today. But my question today is, is what does it mean to be called a Christian? And uh, so I'm going to uh, uh, approach this from the uh, biblical uh, standpoint of the three places in the Word of God where the uh, term Christian is used, in only three places. In the first instance, we see it in Acts chapter 11 and verse 26. It says here, uh, And when they had found him, they brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves together with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So that's the first instance that we hear the term Christian being used. And the second we find in the book of Acts also, and in chapter 26 and verse 28, it says that Agrippi, this speaking about the king, King Agrippi of, uh, of uh, Jerusalem there, Jerusalem times. Then King Agrippi said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And so there we find the second uh, uh, phrase or the term Christian. And then finally in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. And so here's the three places that we find the word Christian. The world today, uh, uh, it seems as though we uh, use the term very loosely. I heard somewhere they said there's over one billion Christians in the world. I guess they count everybody who's not a Muslim or not a Hindu or not, you know. So uh, the, 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 the large uh, phrase right off the bat we have is that there's a lot of Christians in the world today. But uh, we're going to narrow it down a little bit by the Word of God. And my uh, uh, sermon this morning, or my message, is not to divide and say, okay, who is a Christian and who isn't? This is an individual uh, a perception of the individual. Each one of you must ask yourself the question, do I fit the qualifications of this office of being a Christian? It's the same as any other office that we would uh, be speaking about. For example, let's say that you were a brain surgeon and you, had a, uh, you determined that you wanted to be a brain surgeon. So you uh, get yourself, set yourself up a little desk and on it you put your name, my name, put your name, and then underneath you put brain surgeon. Now, uh, the qualification, have you ever been to school to study uh, brain surgery? No. Have you ever picked up a scalpel? No, you don't even know what it is. But yet you want to be called a brain surgeon. So there are certain qualifications to becoming a brain surgeon. And uh, the same is true with any office or any place. And so we're going to look at those circumstances of being called a Christian. Uh, one time, many years ago, I was holding uh, uh, Bible studies in a, in a little uh, cafeteria type uh, setting. And there was little booths there, and we were sitting in a booth, about six or seven people here, and two people on the other, way on the other side of the booth, there was a petition there, you know. And as we were talking, I turned to the person who was sitting over on the other side, and I said to him, are you a Christian? And he said, of course I'm a Christian, I'm not a Muslim. He would just took the idea that automatically, because he was born in this country, because he was raised in a Christian, so to speak, uh, Christian world or Christian community, that he felt himself to be a Christian. And uh, so I would like to ask you this morning, again, I want to ask you very sincerely, are you a Christian and do you know what it means to be a Christian? And so we look at the first instance here, now we're going to start looking at what does it mean when I call myself a Christian. And uh, we find that the, uh, in the book of Acts here, we find that uh, the church had gathered or assembled together and they uh, uh, were praying and worshiping together and they were teaching uh, to the people of that community. And the people of that community 
began to recognize them as a faith and they called them Christians. They said, oh, the Christians, all right? It doesn't really give us the idea that, uh, that the Christians identified themselves as Christians. It doesn't put a church, Christian church. But as we look at it, it says the disciples were first called Christians, first in Antioch. They were called Christians, okay? And so let's look at what is it uh, identified them in this instance. It says when they found him, they brought him into, this is talking about the Apostle Paul, and they brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass that the whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. Here, so uh, hanging in with Christians and uh, uh, hanging out with Christians has something to do with uh, uh, gathering and worshiping together. Here it says that they assembled together for a whole year. It wasn't an on and off type of thing. It doesn't say that they assembled and came to church on Easter and on Christmas as some so-called Christians do, you know. Oh, well, it's Easter. We might better go to church. But coming to church and assembling together, as it says in the book of Hebrews, it says to forsake not the assembling of yourself, as is the practice of some. Some don't want to assemble, don't want to come to church. But if there is a hunger in your heart, if there is a thirst for the Word of God, then it is important that you come together and you uh, uh, um, assemble together to hear the Word of God. And you know, sometimes uh, you might have a question concerning God's Word and you say, I wonder what this means, I wonder what that means, you know. And sometimes when we get, come into the church, the minister or maybe the teacher or somebody in the church might uh, 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 cover a certain subject, and that subject may not be covered again for another six months or a year or so on. And so you miss that opportunity. You've, you've missed that chance to hear what that has to say about uh, uh, the Christian walk. The disciples, it says, were called Christians. Now, what is a disciple? A disciple is one who disciplines himself. I, uh, uh, no, I, I cannot say that I actually saw the movie, but I, I have seen some of the movie of this. Uh, the, they have a movie that's called The Karate Kid. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. And in this, here's a young boy who's, who's uh, 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 not very apt at anything, and he's put under the wing of some uh, master uh, uh, trainer, and this trainer begins to train him and begins to uh, 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 get him into shape to do certain things. And he became a disciple of that master. And he uh, uh, learned the tactics and the things that he had to do to be able to compete in that uh, sport, whatever that might have been. But I want to say that this is very similar to becoming a Christian and being a disciple, dis disciplining yourself. You know, sometimes, um, sometimes in our life, you know, when we come to know Jesus, that we have had a, a loose life, we've, we've done whatever we wanted to do, we've lived a certain kind of lifestyle, and when we come into the church and we begin to be washed by the Word of God, the Word of God begins to wash us, and uh, we become disciplined to change. And sometimes, you know, the Bible says in one place, it says that God checked me loved. And sometimes uh, uh, we're rebuked. Sometimes we're, we're uh, uh, told that we have to change our lifestyle a little bit. And we have to come on to becoming uh, a more disciplined life in the Christian walk. And so as we become more disciplined and as we uh, uh, yield ourselves to the Word of God, then we can really call ourselves disciples. But if every time you come to church or every time somebody disciplines you, and I came to help it when my children were young. One of the things, the most hated thing that ever bothered me is I would tell one of my kids to do something or something, you know, and they go like this. To me. They do it, but they, they give me this, you know what I mean? Like, oh, like, you know, I, you know I, I'll do it, but I don't want to do it. They turn the shoulder hard, you know. And this is the way it is in the church sometimes, that we try to give a word of discipline to someone, but they, they take it, but they don't like it. They don't care. It's the old self. It's the old nature cropping up and saying, no, I don't want to do it. How wonderful it is if we were here, the word of God, 
and we say, oh, thank the Lord. I wondered if I was doing the right thing. Now I know I'm going to have to change that lifestyle a little bit and discipline myself, discipline my actions, discipline my tongue, discipline my walk and how I should live. Yeah, you know that before we were saved, you know, that we might uh, uh, go here and there, you know. A young man, you know, he goes out to the bar or the saloon or goes partying and uh, young ladies, you know, they go here and there. And they, then they come to know Jesus, you know, and they come into the church. And so somebody's got to tell them, you can't go there anymore. You can't do those things anymore. You can't live like that anymore. You've got to change your tongue. You can't talk like that anymore. And so as they begin to change their lifestyle, not because... We, uh, uh, not because we have a set of rules and we say you have to live by these rules, but it's the washing of the Word of God in our life. It's the morality that God brings into our life. We look into the city of Syracuse sometimes and we see the terrible things that are going on over there. Undisciplined lives. And they got this gr the latest thing out where they call the knockout punch, you know, where you walk up to a perfect stranger, you line him up, and then you whack, you hit the guy and try to knock him out. With one punch. It's. You punch until you knock him out. That's what I heard. Huh? That's what I heard. About the two little kids. Yeah. They yeah. Killed the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Just recently, a, a man was killed. Well, they tried to defame the man who was hit. Nobody, I don't care what your crime is or how low life you might be, you don't have, you should not be subject to be able to walk down the street and have somebody come and, and knock you out or try to knock you out. And this is because a lack of morals, a lack of discipline, a lack of, uh, of love in the lives of these young people, and so that they, have, they are living in an undisciplined lifestyle. Now, when they come to know Christ, Christ is going to have to work in their lives. The Word is going to have to wash them, and they're going to have to become disciplined. As for that city, and as for those people, they have become the wards of the state, and so they... Get away with the things they do because the state lets them get away with it. Because they feed them, they take care of them, they do those things for them, and they don't know how to handle it. You see, a state can punish somebody, but the state cannot bring uh, a moral discipline to anyone. Uh, uh, you, usually when you uh, m have a criminal mind, unless God comes in and changes that criminal mind, you can punish them all day long. And all they do is become more spiteful, I remember my mother used to say years ago, she says, uh, they, they, they cut off their nose to spite their face. They're so spiteful, some people. And that is because of sin. That's because of that uh, 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 retrobate mind. In other words, I cannot receive those things. I'm not going to do it. But when Christ comes into our life, we must become disciplined. Uh, uh, they were uh, consistent, the Bible says, for a whole year. There was something that they said and something that they did that identified them with Christ. Now, we all have identities, and we're all Americans. We all belong to a church. We may be call ourselves Pentecostal. We may say we're Baptist-oriented, or we say Methodist-oriented. So we all identify with these things. And uh, uh, occasionally, you know, you might be called. I remember one time they called me uh, when I began to uh, speak one time, and I told a person about Christ. He says, oh, he said to me, oh, oh you're, you're one of those. You're one of those, in other words. We're identified with somebody. When they call the Christians at that time, they may not have uh, said it in a loving manner. They were a sect of religious zealots that followed the teachings of one Jesus Christ, and they fashioned their lifestyle to those teachings and that lifestyle. And so that they were called the uh, 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 Christians. I want to bring out a, a scripture from the book of Matthew in chapter 27 and verse 26. And it says, Jesus was speaking. He says, Everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. You see, uh, Christians are called because they not only hear the word of God, but they must do those things. And this is what discipline is. Jesus says, and I love this scripture, you know, there's a big conflict in the church between the 
the, uh, uh, the Calvinist and the Armenian teaching, you know, one believes that you're saved once you give your heart to the Lord, you never lose your salvation. The other one believes that, you know, that, that there are conditions to that, to that being saved, you know. And I like to put myself into that a little bit. I believe that both sides have a powerful argument. But one of my favorite verses is found in the Gospel of John in chapter 10. And we read here that Jesus said that, uh, uh, let me read this here. First, I'm going to read the one verse. Uh, John chapter 10 and verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So here we have this wonderful scripture that says that nobody can pluck them out of the hand of God. And when you say, what has that got to do with being called a Christian? I'm going to get to it. But listen to this. Let's read the whole context, you know. My pastor used to say sometimes, you know, you go to the refrigerator, you're going to make a sandwich. So you pull out a little loaf meat or something, and you begin to chew it, and you chew on that for a little while. That's not a sandwich. You make a sandwich, take a piece of bread here, you put your peanut butter or your meat or whatever you're going to put, then you put another slice of bread, you eat the whole sandwich, a little lettuce in there too, oh, excuse me. And then you eat the whole sandwich, you know. And sometimes we have to eat the whole Word of God when we read it. Here we read this morning, I read it says, And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So we have they and them. So my question is, I want to know who is they and who is them. So when we read the whole context, now watch this. Chapter uh, uh, 10, verse 25, Jesus said unto them, I told you, and ye believe not the works that I do. My Father, they bear witness of me. Verse 26, but ye believe not, because are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So here we have they and them. Here the, here's the they and the them that we've been looking for. The ones that we read later on, that no one shall pluck them out of the hand of God. They and them. Who is they and them? They and them are those who hear the word of God and follow his word. So that if you want to call yourself a Christian, you want to say that you have eternal life, you must be one of those willing to hear the word of God and to follow what the word of God says. Here, let me read it again. It says, and I give unto them, uh, uh, verse 20, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. There's one of them. And they follow me. Verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And I love that. I love that scripture. That is a total scripture. Now we're looking at how that we as God's people are called into the church. We are called to be disciples, to be disciplined, and to be corrected. And so here we are, we find the first instance of the word Christian and how it's used. <clears throat> uh, uh, who are those, as I said, who are not able to be plucked out of the hand of God? but those who hear the word of God and do it. We go to the second instance we find in Acts chapter 28. Paul is held a prisoner on trial for his life, and he's witnessing before King Agrippi. Now there's two uh, uh, great men there. One is Agrippi, and the other is uh, uh, Festus, is it? Uh, is it Festus or Felix? Festus, I think. And uh, so here they are. They're uh, uh, Festus, and uh, and Festus now is he he's a complete uh, heathen. He doesn't know the word of God. He doesn't know anything about the word of God. But uh, uh, Agrippi is acquainted with the word of God. Now, we, when you go to witness, and this is the second part, is that we must become witnesses of Jesus Christ. It, it isn't just enough to say I hear His word and I'm doing it. I'm living that life. I've disciplined my life. But now the Bible calls Christians to be a witness. And so you're going to witness to one of two 
types of people. You're going to witness to those who have never heard the word of God and those that have heard the word of God and they know a little bit about the word of God. And so you, can, you have to entertain them or, or reach them in a different way. But here Paul now, and, and I think this is an important part of this story, is that Paul is on, he's a prisoner and that he's on trial for his life. Acts chapter 26 and verse 27, King Agrippi, Paul says, King Agrippi, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. You see here that, here we see the, the, uh, uh, the character of Paul who is obliging and helping Agrippi. That here he knows that Agrippi knows these things, but to keep Agrippi from being embarrassed over it, he quickly says, I know that you believe. You see? And sometimes when we're preaching the word of God to someone or we're, we're witnessing or speaking to them, that we have to consider that we are, our main goal is not to embarrass them, not to offend them, not to hurt them, but to bring them into the house of God. We've got to bring them in. And so if we are talking to those who have never heard the word of God, we have to approach them one way. And those that have heard the word of God, we approach them a little bit differently. So Paul says, I know that you believe. Now verse uh, 28 says, Then Agrippi says to Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. There's very little more written here about what Agrippi says. So there are some in the church who feel that Agrippi was uh, uh, just rebuking Paul and said, With a little ado that you're going to make me a Christian. And some who feel that with this little statement that you made, you have almost made me to be a Christian. And in either case, we are not so much interested in the aspect of how uh, Greppi uh, 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 answered this, but we are looking at it from the perspective of being a Christian, that we have to present the Word of God to those. And sometimes when you present the Word of God, that it may not be accepted. And it's a tough thing. It's a hard thing when those of your peers or those around you, when you believe something and you have something in your life and they will not believe like you or they cannot believe like you. It's, it's, it's sometimes the only word that I can think of is, isn't it? And that you, it's so clear to you that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He gave His life shed his blood for our sins, and they can't see that. They can't understand that, you see? And so sometimes it becomes very frustrating. But Paul, verse 29, And Paul said, Would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether as much as I accept these bonds. In other words, here was Paul's heart. Paul was suffering a great persecution. Paul was at the point of being put to death by these people. And yet he said, I, I hope that all of you would be able to receive those things that I have received, that you could be like me. You see, to be a Christian, you must have an attitude that you want others to receive the things that you have received. That you are able to witness to others and bring them to Christ. Agrippi, as I said, had a background in the Jewish faith. He knew the prophecies. He knew those things concerning the uh, uh, Messiah. He was no stranger to the words that Paul spoke. But he did not want to be identified. In the final analysis, he did not want to be identified with Jesus Christ. You and I, those that claim to be Christians, we must be identified with Jesus Christ. We must stand up and say, I am for Jesus Christ. I am a Christian. I, I do believe these things. These things uh, are, are pertinent to my belief. The unbeliever, the faith, is a stumbling block. It scrapes against their lifestyle. They don't want to hear it. And when you come into a room and you're a Christian and you're among those who are not saved, they may not say it to your face, but they're thinking, oh, no, here comes this one again. He's going to bring out those things about Christ. And, you know, I, I, uh, it's not the place for this. It should be only done in church. That's the place for that. And uh, 
they have that attitude. Unfortunately, there are many in the church who feel the same way. That the only time that we should witness is when we're in church. But the Bible tells us to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so we are called out, not only with our lifestyle of belief, but with our tongue and our conversation that we must bring this message. There are two groups of people on the earth. There's a saved and the unsaved. <laughs> Agrippi wants to make it clear that he wasn't going to be won over. He would not transfer his faith over to become one of those believers. In Psalm 19 and verse 26, it says, I will speak of the testimonies before kings, and I will not be ashamed. And so that we must learn to give witness and testimony to those around us. Sometimes it's those that we work with, and you have to be careful that, you know, the Bible does say in one place, it says to cast not the pearl before what? The swine, huh? So, so that sometimes, you know, there are those who they only want to make fun of you or they want to find cause or reason to ridicule you. And it, uh, the Spirit of God will speak to you and let you know who those individuals are. You leave them in God's hands. God will work out their life. As I said, Paul's life was on the line, but he preached Christ. He could have denied Christ, and he could have had peace of this world, and the Jews would have let him go. And you know, sometimes that's the way we act. We get into a group or with a crowd of people and you, we say with our, in ourselves, we say, well, tonight I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. I'm just going to go along with everything and uh, uh, not cause any uh, conflicts uh, among people. There's a scripture in the Old Testament where Jeremiah had that very feeling. He would go to his people and he would tell them that they have to repent, that they have to come to God. And they kept ridiculing him and they told him even they says look don't give us this hard stuff why don't you go along get along with us and uh, uh, give us something smooth you know and some of our uh, ministers today uh, they get in the pulpit and they like to talk about social issues about how the social needs that we have in this world you know and they they bring out a nice smooth comfortable uh, 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 message you know and and you know uh, I remember back in the uh, 1970s when I got saved, one of the great messages is the, the love of God. Agape, the agape love, you know. And we all talk about agape love, a love that God loved. Love, 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 love. It's wonderful. And the Bible says that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever receiveth Him and believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting, eternal Life And so we have this uh, uh, message today that's presented, you know, this love message, the love gospel. And uh, anytime that we want to take the Bible in context, remember that Jesus spoke of hell more than he spoke of heaven. The whole Bible, the whole context of the Bible has more in it about the punishment, the wrath of God, than it has about the love and the caring of God. Does that mean that God doesn't love or care? Oh, He loves and cares. Uh, as I said last week, that uh, we must always remember that if we are saved, we must remember what we are saved from. Those that are unsaved means that they are in big trouble. The Bible says that the wrath of God rests on those who do not have the Son of God. When we get with the unsaved, do we act like the unsaved? Are we embarrassed to stand for Christ? Are we afraid to identify ourselves with Jesus? If we are, then we do not meet the criteria of being a Christian on the second account. Okay? The first account is discipleship and learning the Word of God. The second one is being able to witness, be able to bring the Word of God to others around us. And so this is... Uh, 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 what we do sometimes when we get with uh, uh, God's people do we jest and mock do we make jokes about the word of God we may have trials and tribulations in the life and are we caught up defending ourselves and uh, so much that we have forgotten that we are witnesses of Jesus Christ you know you get with a group of people and they say uh, you say uh, well 
How are you today? And you begin to lament about all your problems. Okay? Who in this life doesn't have some problems? We all have problems in this life. Could you imagine if Agrippi had said to Paul, Hey, Paul, how you doing? What's going on in your life? What is, what is it that you have to tell us? And Paul began to lament about the chains on my arms and, and they put me in prison and then they whipped me and beat me and they stoned me and, and, and look at me over here. This was not the message of Paul. Paul's message was, you must receive Christ into your life. His desire was to persuade Agrippi to become a Christian. Let me ask you, as a Christian, are you a persuader? Are you a persuader this morning? Do you persuade people to come to Christ? Uh, the third instance we have is found in the book of 1 Peter, and I'll turn to that here in 1 Peter. And uh, uh, here uh, we find uh, Peter, uh, uh, chapter 4 and verse 16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. To suffer as a Christian in those days, the Christians were subject to ridicule. Boy, doesn't that sound familiar? That sounds like today, doesn't it? Let They were identified as one of those crazy believers. And they were raised to ridicule. I think that we are living in a day and age when we can become ashamed of being a Christian. <clears throat> Remember in the Garden of Eden when we first hear of the word shame. What is shame? Shame, every time we hear the word shame, it identifies with sin. Adam and Eve were doing great with God. They were uh, friends of God. They were right standing with God. Everything was going along good. They had but one rule they had to follow. Don't eat of that tree. You can have all the fruit of the garden. Do whatever you want here. Have a good time. But do not eat of that tree. It doesn't say anything in there about driving unregistered vehicles or anything like that. And what did Eve do? She got listening to that snake and the snake said, has God said that you will die if you eat of that tree? You are not going to die. And she looked upon the tree and it looked good to her. And she says, oh man, that looks good. I'll bet it tastes good. And the snake says, yeah, it tastes pretty good. He says, why don't you try some of it? And she did. She ate it. And then to make the matters worse, she gives some to her husband and he eats it. What happened? What are we talking about? We're talking about shame, aren't we? And so all of a sudden, they, after they ate of that tree, they became shameful. And shame drove them into the woods. And they hid themselves in the woods. And they covered themselves with leaves. God came walking into the garden and he said, Adam and Eve, where, where are you? We're over here. Why are you hiding? Because we're ashamed. Who told you that you were naked? See, God knew that something had happened. And so we find that shame came into this world by sin. And so if a Christian is ashamed and we uh, identify ourselves in shame, that we are identify, identifying ourselves that, that there's something wrong in our life. And the Bible tells us that, <coughs> excuse me, the Bible tells us that Christ died and shed his blood so that we could have, that we could be free from sin, that we could, that we could overcome sin. And so we don't have anything to really be shameful. See how the devil tries to twist that shame around on us and tries to put the shame back upon us? When the real shame is those who are living in sin. And those that live in sin and those that harbor sin in their life are the ones that ought to have the shame. Uh, Christ died and took shame and the sin upon himself. As I said, we have nothing to be ashamed of. In Psalms chapter 119 and verse 6, it, the Bible says, and, and shall I not be ashamed when I, when I have respect unto all thy commandments? 
In Psalm uh, 25, 2, O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. In Psalm 31, in verse 1, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed and deliver me in thy righteousness. And so, look at the scripture, and Peter said, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin in the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteousness are scarcely saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their soul to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. God sends correction into the church when it's needed. If you are called a Christian and you have been baptized into the church, into the body of Christ, you will be corrected and chastened by God and you can grow in Christ. If you reject that fight of God's correction, then you are like the child who rejects his parents' correction and correction. What do you suppose is going to happen to that child when he, when he continually rejects that correction? He rejects it. He doesn't listen. We read earlier where it says in the Gospel of John, it says that my sheep hear my voice and follow me. And so that we must humble ourselves and we must subject ourselves to the correction of God. I want to talk just for a second about, well, more than a second, about what it means to be a Christian. You see that God has an order of things that he has created. God created the angels. And when we read a little bit about the angels, we read about how mighty those angels are and the different span of what they are and the powers that they have. We read about the archangels. And the archangels were very powerful and they're very uh, 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 wise in their way. That We read about Lucifer. Lucifer was one of the great angels of God. And he drew a third of the angels with him and he fought against God. You imagine that God made an angel so powerful that even to this very day that we war against not flesh and blood but against principalities and powers in high places. These angels, these great angels that God has created come and war against us. They are not uh, the figment of our imagination, but a great and mighty army that has arrayed itself against the church. And so God has created these things. God, in his day and in his time, he created great things upon this earth. We read in the, in the scripture about the behemoth and about the creature of the deep and the great beast that God made, the uh, elephants. Just not long ago, they... Uh, uh, I was looking in the paper just the other day where they said that some Russian scientists had found uh, a, a mammoth buried in the ice and they were able to extract blood from that creature. Imagine a 10,000 year old creature, they extracted blood. Now they're talking about that they want to uh, bring that creature back to life through uh, cloning. And one day we may see one of the great creatures that God made this huge monster, bigger than, a, than an elephant that, he, that God had made. God made all these great old creatures of old and all these things. But the greatest creation of God is you and me. The Bible says that we are of a new creation. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away, behold, all things become new. Of all the creation that God made, of all the creatures that God made, you are the greatest of those creations. You are the ones that God has chosen to live with him, to actually be with him, to be the tent of his holy being. The Bible says, know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And so that being and identifying with Christ and being a Christian is a, uh, is a great thing. The Bible says that one day, don't you know that the saints shall judge and rule the world, that we will take over, not this old world that we live in, but a new world, 
a new world where Christ comes down and where Christ uh, has set up his government and his economy upon the earth where you and I will reign and rule with, with Christ. And what a wonderful, wonderful time I'm sure that's going to be. We are willing to bear the name of Jesus without sin. Without We're willing to bear the name Christian to be discipled and disciplined our lives after the Word of God. And we are able to be a Christian and go out and witness and testify of His great life. The true Christian is a follower of Christ. The true Christian loves the Word of God. The true Christian bears the name without shame. The true Christian forgives his brother and loves his neighbor. Uh-oh, woo, let me, read that. let me say that again. The true Christian loves and bears the name and loves his brother and loves his neighbor. Isn't that wonderful? The Christian testifies of his faith in Jesus. Don't be a Christian in name only, but in deed. Put your faith in the name of the risen Christ and live as a Christian. Now those that live in the world who claim to be Christians, who call upon the name of God and say, oh, I'm a Christian. Now you know. Have they disciplined Christ? Are they washed by the Word of God every day? Are they willing to witness and testify of Christ? Not their glory, not how great they are, but how great He is. And are they not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Jesus said that if you are ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before the Father and before the holy angels. On that great day, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation, and uh, I think it's in uh, chapter 20, and down around verse 11, it talks of a great white throne judgment. And you know, <clears throat> when judgment comes, there's always a prosecutor and there's always a, a, a defensive uh, 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 lawyer there or an attorney to, to help those who are coming up for judgment. And the only attorney, the only lawyer that's going to be there, his name is going to be and is Jesus Christ. And when you go before the Father, if you don't have a mediator, if you don't have somebody who will speak for you, Somebody who says, I shed my blood for that man, and he is a Christian, you're in big trouble. You're going to be in big trouble. You may call yourself a Christian. You may go to church somewhere. You may hear about the social gospels. And you may decry all about all the things, the bad things that are going on in this world. But unless you uh, 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 bring your life in subjection to the Word of God and unless you become a witness for Jesus Christ, you are not going to make it. You're not really a Christian. You're like the man who has the sign that says, I'm a brain surgeon, but he never went to school. You're like the man who says, I'm a lawyer, but he doesn't have any kind of degree or any, any kind of study or anything behind him. All he knows is, I'm right and you're wrong. Those kinds of people are not going to make it into the kingdom of God. Let us stand together. <clears throat> Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed when we come into the Father's house. Don't be ashamed to be called a Christian. And remember, when someone asks you what it means to be a Christian, it isn't just a word that we put on the side of a building. It isn't just a word that we may have heard and we say, well, I'm not Muslim, I'm Christian. What does it mean to be a Christian? Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, again and again for your goodness and for your mercy. Lord, help us that we might live a life that's pleasing to you. Lord, that we might become uh, 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 stronger Christians, that our faith be uh, 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 increased, Lord, we pray. Help us, we pray, with these things. We pray for our little ones, Lord. Watch over them and keep them. Lord, keep our tongue and keep our being in subject to you, we pray. And we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.